One of my best friends in seminary was a 290 pound football player from Kansas. Let it be simply stated that he and I grew up in literally different worlds. He's an utterly competitive person, and I am really not competitive, which annoys most people in the ways that I play board games. That's a different homily. But suffice it to say that I loved to humble my good friend. And one of the ways I did that over our, the course of seminary is taking that Kansan skiing. <laughs> Father Jacob, my good friend, has this ethos of I can will my way through anything. He could just try harder eventually enough to push the weight he needed to push in the weight room for football, for whatever. Father Jacob's also a twin. And so that adds to the inherent competition knit within his DNA. Taking him up to the mountains, we went to Loveland the first time because we're not going to waste a whole bunch of money on bunny hills. And as we were going down, he assumed what he thought was some kind of a ski position and then and tensed his body really intensely and willed him to go faster. And it didn't happen, and he fell over and left a dent in the mountain. <laughs> the wonderfully awesome thing about skiing is, yes, it takes a certain physical strength. Yes, there's, there's, um, it's, it's hard on the body. But once you learn a technique for the terrain, there's a flow that you enter into. And it becomes intuitive and second nature, and it makes the activity very joy-filled. You don't have to just will it. You can flow with the objectivity of the mountain. It's, in a sense, having the docility to live in reality that I can go around this and over that, and I don't need to just bowl through things. And it takes, if you've ever taken a low-level friend skiing, it takes two to three days to literally rewire the brain on a very low-friction, sloped terrain. And then you can kind of pick it up over time. When I was in college, uh, I got really into rock climbing. And rock climbing is another one of these activities that you can will your way up the wall and you might be able to get most of the way there on like a f somewhere between a 5'4 and a 5'9 rate. But much more than that, you're going to tire yourself out. The secret to rock climbing is placing most of the work on your legs. And most people place most of the work on their hands and forearms. Why? Because it's what they can see. If you're stuck to a wall, it's a lot harder to look down and then you have to sometimes contort your body and then, and that's tough. And so if I just look at what I can see and what I can control and I just try harder, then it works for a time, but again, you're going to tire yourself out and you won't enter into the state of flow according to the sport. You can't just will your way through difficulty. Sometimes it takes a personal conversion to change your technique, to change your body posture, to change even your understanding of the task at hand. And the beauty of all this is there's a homily in there somewhere. <laughs> My friends, St. Paul's letter to Timothy, this would be Paul the Apostle, who is taking Timothy under his care, teaching him the ropes of being an apostle. He who is this young man who will one day become a bishop, 
who's having to learn the giving of the gospel to people and the suffering, their free will, and everything that's joyful and beautiful and heartbreaking about ministry. And St. Paul says to Timothy and the community over which he presides, he says, bear your share of hardship for the gospel. That's something that's in most of our heads. We know that we have to take up our cross daily and follow him. But he says this, bear your share of hardship for the gospel with the strength that comes from God. You and I have facets of difficulty, of suffering, that are kind of just knit in the circumstances of our life. And sometimes, you and I take on the posture of my Kansas friend who attempted skiing, of just willing our way through things, of just clenching our bodies and making it happen. And that's fine for a time. And then just like, skiing or rock climbing or sports that require you to learn a technique and a mindset, even a change of worldview, unless you do that change, you'll tire yourself out and you'll give up. So too it is with the Christian life. Most people who reference Catholic guilt are those that don't live Catholic joy. And so they live out of this narrative of, oh, it's this religion with so many rules. Except those who give their life to Jesus, who've been transformed by the invitation of the gospel, live a happiness, a joy, an effervescence in the Holy Spirit in such a way that it's transformative. And then they have the strength to bear their hardship with the strength that comes from God. Here's an image for you. If the Lord asks you to drive to Broomfield, let's say that the Lord asks you to go visit your mother, your mother-in-law at a nursing home in Broomfield. You're here at Most Precious Blood. You're leaving the parking lot. How much gas is the Lord going to give you for your trip to Broomfield? The answer is enough to get to Broomfield. Now, some of us will say, well, I know I need to go visit my mom and whatever, and, but there's this secondhand store that I really want to go thrifting at in Lakewood, so I'm going to like stop off over there, and then I saw this really cool thing at Target online, and I have a coupon, and so I'm going to go stop in Westminster. And then when we run out of gas, because the Lord specifically asked us to go to Broomfield then we're stuck somewhere on Wadsworth, on the side of the road, cursing God. Because we think, this is your fault. My friends, if the Lord's asking you to go to Broomfield, he'll give you enough gas to go to Broomfield. Bear your share of hardship for the gospel with the strength that comes from God. The beauty of this is, is we're given a day in which to rest. And as society and our personal lives become all the more exasperated, filled with anxiety and frenetic energy and all these to-dos, the first place to start is to examine how do I use my Sundays. If the Lord gives us a list of ten do's and don'ts, Not for the sake of limiting our freedom, but for the sake of enabling us to be who we truly are. In which number five is don't kill, thus showing the importance of the list. Number three, my friends, is take a chill pill. Number three is keep holy the Sabbath. Enter into a day of rest. Enter into a day of worship. Fill your tanks so that you might have enough to go to Broomfield. And then if you enter into rest really well, you might also have enough to get to Lakewood. But so often you and I run short 
and then we start blaming the people around us. I'm the one holding up this family. I'm, it's my incessant sacrifice that's allowing the dishwasher to be oh, uh, cleared. Yes, but are you doing it with joy, with love, with peace, with patience, with kindness? I think most of us would rather some dirty dishes to kind of pristine hostility. And so what's the call, what's the command of God for each of us? To enter into rest. And it's something that we don't take seriously enough. If you're one of the families that kind of, you go to Mass maybe once a month, Maybe if someone is signed up to be a lector or an altar server or whatever it is, then sure, you show up to Mass, but then what about the other weekends? If you're in the dabbling to Mass two to three times uh, a month, but you would never go on vacation because it's vacation, you might consider restructuring your Sundays so that you have time to go to Mass. You have time to receive the words of the Gospel. You have time to receive our Lord's precious body and blood given for love of you. And that you might have time to go home, put in a casserole that you made the day prior, and fall asleep watching golf. Or whatever your weird form of rest on Sunday may be. When you and I don't take advantage of the Sabbath as a day of rest, when we treat it as a day to get ahead, then we fall back into a form of self-imposed slavery. Remember, the day of rest was given by the Lord to change the ethos, the worldview, the technique of life of the Israelites. Drawing them out of slavery and into freedom, he commanded that they rest, that they take a chill pill, that they don't use it as a day to get ahead. And sometimes I hear in the confessional, Father, I, I mow my lawn and do a lot of yard work on Sundays. Is that a sin? I'm like, I don't know. Do you enjoy yard work? If you're doing yard work because it's wonderfully meditative and recreative for you, then maybe that is a good use of your time. If you're doing it because your HOA is getting on your butt about something on your property, and you're doing it to just get ahead of your list of tasks, then you're treating Sunday as a day to get ahead, and in the rat race of always getting ahead, you will fall behind. And then you'll enter into a slavery of anxiety and exasperation. And you will take on fights and burdens that the Lord is not asking you to do. And then you will just will your way through life with not a lot of peace, about as much peace as a Kansan on a ski slope. But my friends, if you allow the commandments, the invitations of God to transform how you live, to take Sunday Mass seriously, even while on vacation, to take chunks of rest, then you and I are able to bear our share of hardships with the strength that comes from God. And then we live in a way that's set apart from the rest of the world. We have the ability to evangelize out of joy and peace and not out of rules and morality. Yes, love has real demands, but love is also very pleasing. And so the joy of the gospel message that's given to us is the Lord strengthens us for the work that he asks us to do. Remember, Abraham was called out of his comfort and it was promised that through him would, become, would come a blessing. And thus, in his son offered up Isaac and then re-received Jacob and the nation of Israel and then Jesus Christ himself as a blessing for all nations. This moment of the transfiguration, Jesus is building up the apostles for what is to come. Peter wants to remain because it's pleasant and awesome. And if you ever go to the Holy Land, the base 
of the hill of the transfiguration has the best pomegranate juice in all of Israel. You need to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. But Jesus builds them up in their understanding of his, debil- of his divinity, of his ability to conquer sin and death and slavery. Because what's going to come a few pages later in the gospel? Good Friday. And unless they drink in their understanding of Jesus' divinity, then they will fall to confusion and exasperation and fear as 11 of the 12 of them did do on Good Friday. And the beauty of Jesus is this, the beauty of the gospel is this, even when we fall short, even when we creep back into slavery, even when we, like Peter, abandon and deny Jesus, he does not abandon and deny us. It doesn't matter if your mass attendance record throughout your life is abysmal. You can show up now and next Sunday as well and turn over a new leaf and follow the Lord. You can begin to reorient your Sundays to be able to rest. You can begin to move the technique of your life from your hands to your feet in a place that's less visible and less controllable, but is the way that God made you. You can live in the freedom of the children of God. And you can be happy, which is exactly what Jesus wants for each of us. Praised be Jesus Christ. Just by way of a reminder, two weeks ago I wrote a bulletin article and last week preached on the fact that now at this parish, We've moved towards kneeling at all the regular parts of the Mass. And so that'll be uh, at the consecration for sure. Um, But then also after the Holy, Holy, Holy. Um, And then after the reception of Holy Communion. And so if that's new to you, if you haven't received any of those messages, um, just do what the person next to you is doing. Do it out of great love and do it in unity with not only this church, but all the churches that surround us. Let us stand and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Lastly, um, I know for some of you, coming to Mass is its own really intense sacrifice. Either this is your one day to be able to sleep in, and your version of sleeping in is my version of sleeping in, which means 11 a.m. And so even just getting here is, is, is a tough sacrifice. Um, or for some of you, it's braving the parking lot situation, or just... Driving on Colorado Boulevard is an act of penance by itself. So whatever it is, to make right, Mass, uh, to set Sundays as a different day, is its own sacrifice, which is precisely why we say, pray dearly, beloved, that my sacrifice in yours may be acceptable. And then bringing the sufferings from the weak, bringing uh, the hardships that we've had to bear for the sake of following Jesus, we come to be strengthened by him who's not asking us to do the impossible. Well, it is impossible if we try to do it by ourselves. But if we live transformed by the invitation of the gospel, then it's very possible and the Lord gives us the strength to do it. And so for your presence here at Sunday Mass uh, and every Sunday Mass, I'm deeply grateful. The Lord be with you. Bow down for the blessing. Bless your faithful, O Lord, with a blessing that endures forever, and keep them faithful to the gospel of your only begotten Son, so that they may always desire at last to attain that glory whose beauty he showed in his own body to the amazement of the apostles, through Christ our Lord. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life.